Hello everybody, I'm about to be joined by Dr. Cher, who is a world-renowned fertility expert and specialist from Cher Fertility Solutions based in New York and also in Las Vegas in California. Um, so we're going to be talking all about embryo implantation dysfunction and how people can uh, have treatment for it, what they can look for, what they should be asking when they see a specialist, how Share Fertility Solutions based in Las Vegas and California, um, Las Vegas and New York can support them and everything else in between. So please do have your questions ready for Dr. Share. He's very, very well regarded in the field and has huge expertise. So let's see if he's here. Where is everyone joining from today? Love to know. Here we go. Hi to those who are joining. We're just about to connect with Dr. Cher, who is a world-class fertility specialist and expert who founded Cher Fertility Solutions back in 2019, I believe. Hello, good morning, Hi, Dr. Cher. How are you? Very well, thank you. It's an absolute privilege and pleasure to have you on our Instagram Live today. So That's thank very you. kind, thank you. Um, could you start by telling us a little bit about your expertise and Share Fertility Solutions, which I know that you founded, I believe, in 2019, is that right? That's correct, but I go back quite a while. In 1982-83, I founded, after coming back from England, where I worked with Patrick Stepto, who started in vitro fertilization worldwide, and Bob Edwards, I came back to the United States and established the first private IVF program in the country. Amazing. And that was back in 1982-83. Okay. And opened up programs all over in the United States and helped others abroad establish programs. And uh, in a few years ago, we established Fertility Solutions. I'd given up all the other programs and decided to retire, but couldn't handle the retirement. <laughs> decided to get back in again. So I uh, went back in with Dr. Tortorello, and we opened Share Fertility Solutions in Manhattan. And uh, in the career that spans, what, 38 years or something, I've been influential in the birth of approximately 17,000 IVF babies. Wow, that's amazing. It's a lot. It's not me, myself, but the teams I've mm -hmm. established and worked with. And uh, we've done quite a bit in the field and enjoyed it very much. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And Dr. Cher has kindly written for us a fantastic article all around embryo implantation dysfunction, which we're going to be talking about today. So if you head to our link in bio, we will link it up so people can read that um, and find out more about it, which is a fascinating topic because obviously when people are having fertility treatment before they have questions, during they have questions, and if the round doesn't have the outcome that people hope for there must be a lot of questions that would come your way as a doctor in terms of why didn't this work what can we look to change in the future and you know how can how can success be optimized so could you first explain what do you mean by implantation dysfunction well obviously in order for a pregnancy to occur two things have to be working one you have to have a competent embryo primarily a function of the quality of the egg. Not exclusively, but the egg is largely, its competency is largely dependent upon its chromosomal integrity. And then you have to have a uterine lining that's receptive to that fertilized egg or embryo implanting. You can't plant a good seed in a bad soil or a bad seed in a good soil. You have to have both. 80% of the time when a woman fails to get pregnant, following IVF and even probably naturally as well, it's the consequence of the seed, the embryo being the problem. 20% of the time, it's not the seed, it's the soil, the uterine lining. And when there's a problem in the uterine lining that prevents an embryo from either attaching or it allows it to attach poorly and then it's lost or discarded, we are referring to implantation dysfunction separating it from embryo-related issues. Now, it's very important to know that there are many, many, many factors that play a role in implantation. But 80% or more of them are linked to three things. One, 
the thickness and competency of the uterine lining needs to be adequately thickened and developed. We can see that by ultrasound. The second that, it has to, that has to be there is that the uterine cavity has to be smooth and regular inside because if there are little outgrowths or polyps or fibroids or scarring, it'll irritate the lining, cause certain inflammatory cells to rush to the uterus and reject the embryo and destroy it. And the third one is immunologic. And the immunologic causes are not that prevalent, but they do play a role, especially in women who tend to have recurrent or repeated IVF failures without explanation, especially when the embryos or the seeds that you place in the uterus have been proven by PGT or PGS to be chromosomally normal, but yet they don't take. Or women that have recurrent pregnancy loss. They keep losing the pregnancies. And uh, we see it mainly in those, in those two groups of people mm -hmm. or people that have underlying predisposing factors affecting the immune system. One of them, surprisingly, is endometriosis. And few people realize that a third of women with endometriosis have an immunologic problem. Others include things like lupus, erythematosis, rheumatoid arthritis, hypothyroidism, and a variety of other things as well. So immune disorders, either in their personal history or in their family history. So when we see that, then we're concerned. So would you look to um, explore um, complicate or anatomical abnormalities at an early stage, or would you wait for a treatment cycle to not be successful before exploring? You're talking about the anatomical factors? Yes, exactly. In other words, thickness of the lining or the absence or presence of lesions inside the uterus. I think all women undergoing embryo transfer should, within the preceding 12 to 18 months, have evidence of a normal uterine cavity with a smooth inner lining. And it's important to note that doing an HSG or a dye X-ray test doesn't allow that because you're injecting a radio-opaque dye into the uterus and the X-rays won't pass through it, so you'll obscure small lesions. So doing an HSG is not very helpful. You need to do either hysteroscopy, where you look inside the uterus with a very thin instrument while the woman's asleep, inject water or saline solution in the uterus, and really go scuba diving in the uterus and look around. Okay. And the other way to do it, which is much less invasive, less expensive, a tea break procedure is called a water ultrasound or saline ultrasound yep. or a hysterosonogram. Here we inject water into the uterus while the woman's awake to slightly inflate and separate the walls of the uterus. And then when you do an ultrasound, sound traveling very well through liquids will outline the contour and the outline the inside of the uterine cavity. And that'll tell you if the uterus is healthy and normal inside. And if someone has a retroverted uterine, is that an issue? It's irrelevant. One in three uteri are tipped backwards and it's a totally irrelevant. Mm -hmm. if, it's, if there's no other factor forcing it back, such as fibroid tumors or scarring binding the uterus back, but the common finding of a retroverted uterus occurs in the absence of any such pathology. And um, in terms of embryo implant implantation dysfunction, if someone had a cycle of IVF with you, and the first cycle was not successful. You mentioned that 20%, approximately 20% of causes of IVF not being successful are down to um, an issue with the, the uterus. Would you um, have start investigations or would you try again without changing anything from the previous round and put it down to the embryo? Well, that's a little bit of a loaded question. Because obviously, if the woman fails, IVF fails, it only succeeds of about 40% of the time, 30 to 40 in younger women. Women in their early 40s doing IVF with their own eggs cannot expect anywhere near that success rate. Mm -hmm. But if it fails in a woman without explanation, especially when the embryo you've transferred to the uterus is known to be chromosomally normal through PGT, PGS, yep. Yes, I'll start the process. But usually it's in a woman, even before the first attempt, 
if she has a family history of those things I told you or a personal history of predisposing autoimmune conditions. But autoimmunity is not the only reason for implantation dysfunction, which is immunologic. There are other reasons which we can perhaps get into when you're ready. But the important thing to understand is that to go back and look is important if there's no explanation. Obviously, if a woman's failing repeatedly, then you'd be more inclined mm -hmm. to go back and look. So, yes, we would do it to start off with if there are predisposing factors. We would do it in a woman that had had recurrent pregnancy loss, recurrent IVF failure, unexplained IVF failure with good embryos. We'd look for that very okay. definitely, okay. especially immunologic. Mm -hmm. And do you offer immuno immunology? Oh, gosh, <laughs> immunology treatment? Of course. And could you just explain for people who might not be aware, what does that look like? What, what treatment do you give to suppress the infection? Well, as I mentioned, as you mentioned, or will be mentioning in the second part of this article uh, that I wrote, uh, the key to successful implantation from an immunologic perspective is that certain immune cells in the uterine lining known as natural killer cells which are present in the uteri of all women. Thank God we wouldn't be here as a species if they weren't there. And they comprise 70 to 80 percent of all the immune cells in the uterus and their role to regulate the implantation of the root system of the embryo into the wall of the uterus. And they do this through a push-pull mechanism releasing growth factors known as cytokines, of which there are two varieties, Th1 and Th2. And the Th1 cytokines, uh, the, sorry, the Th2 cytokines attract the roots into the wall of the uterus. They're known as humoral cytokines. They make the roots grow into the wall. But if there was no counterbalance to Th1 cytokines, which kill off some of the cells through a process we call apoptosis, you would have the root system growing into the wall, almost permeating the entire wall of the uterus, and the placenta which develops from that root system would not easily come away with the birth of the baby, nor would there be a normal exchange of nutrients, oxygen, and hormones between the mother and baby. Mm -hmm. So you've got to have a balance between the type Th1 and Th2, because the Th1 cytokines kill off some of the cells, allowing the placenta to develop on the inner wall of the uterus and function optimally. Mm -hmm. The problem comes is when there's excess production of Th1 cytokines, and then too many of these cells get destroyed. And now one of two things happens. Either the embryo is lost before the woman even knows she's pregnant. She thinks she's not getting pregnant, but she's really having a mini miscarriage because of the fact that the Th1 cytokines predominate and destroy the roots before she knows she's pregnant or the root system gets damaged and the embryo limps along, runs out of steam and is lost as an early pregnancy loss, chemical pregnancy or a miscarriage. So that's the common thing that we see with typical uh, natural killer cell activation. Mm. But as I mentioned earlier, these natural killer cells don't necessarily only become activated because of an underlying autoimmune process, which means the body reacting to its own tissues. They can also become activated in a very small percentage of cases because of incompatibility genetically between the woman and the man. Sorry, if anyone has questions for Dr. Sher as we're talking, please do feel free to ask. Um, and the link is in our bio for further reading on this topic. And also you can DM us or share fertility solutions for a consultation too. Um, you, I, please expand on what you were just saying. I have questions about, um, you know, uterine, uterine lining thickness. Um, <coughs> apparently there's amazing success with Viagra for uterine blood flow. Is that true? Um, and the mention of the world's first Viagra baby, which I believe was thanks to this method. Is that correct? Yes, it's, this is an interesting story. But just before I say that, you asked me a question earlier. You said, how do we treat it? Yeah. Without going into details, the whole idea is to bring the Th1 and Th2 cytokines into equilibrium, into homeostatic equilibrium. 
And we used to do that by using IVIG, intravenous gamma globulin. We were, in fact, among the first to ever do that in the early 90s. So IVIG does it, but it's a blood product. Nobody wants blood products at this day and age. It is causes significant side effects, especially in certain women, and it's extremely expensive. Right. And the advent of intralipid, which we also introduced some 15 years, 10, 15 years ago, intralipid does the same thing, bringing the, equal, the cytokines into equilibrium. Mm -hmm. But it's a synthetic product. It's not a blood product. And it's about 25 times less expensive than IVIG mm -hmm. and very, very few side effects of any significance. So today we use intralipid, but it doesn't work if you use it alone. You've got to use it in combination with a steroid like prednisone or dexamethasone. Mm -hmm. If you do that, you can bring them into equilibrium for the autoimmune variety. It's a lot more complex. In the other genetic variety, we call alloimmune natural killer cell activation. That's tougher. Those are the ones that commonly cause the recurrent pregnancy loss. So to answer your second question, which had to do with Viagra, I was sitting on an airplane once with my business partner, reading an article in one of the throwaway magazines. And there was an article all about Viagra and how it works. And it suddenly dawned on me, as I was sitting next to this packed airplane, that if it opens blood vessels in the male organ to improve sexual function, Maybe it'll open up the blood vessels in the uterus and allow more estrogen to flow to the inner lining to make the lining get thicker. Wow. And I got so excited, I said, you know how Viagra works. And the whole plane started to break out in a, into, a, into a laugh because it, I just came to my mind that from there we went back, we started doing studies on uterine blood flow by ultrasound, looking at the effects of Viagra, and we did some research, and that's how the very first Viagra baby was conceived. Wow. So now, today it's used all over, and thousands and thousands of babies have been born by improving the thickness of the lining, which has to be at least eight millimeters in thickness, and have a trilaminar appearance, three lines, triple line, in order for there to be optimal implantation. Mm -hmm. So Viagra now is used, but it's gotta be used correctly, you cannot insert into the woman's vagina. You cannot insert a pill. It's got to be a compounded Viagra um, product, which is made by certain pharmacists, organic pharmacists, prepared. And then it gets inserted four times a day uh, and starting early in the cycle. And in more than half of the women with a thin lining, it'll really improve the lining. The wow. other half, it won't work. Which, for which there are reasons why it doesn't work, but it won't work in everyone. Mm -hmm. Do you ever have cases where um, you're not able to perform a transfer because the, the uterine lining isn't thick enough? Well, if the lining is under eight millimeters, I'll never transfer an embryo to the uterus because those embryos either don't take or they take and they get lost. Or even worse still, if there's not enough soil in the plant box for the root system of the placenta to grow into, oftentimes the baby via the placenta is starved of nutrients that doesn't develop properly. So it's far worse to end up with severe growth, retardation, placental insufficiency, and um, sidestep the most important thing we have to do, which is to help a woman have a healthy baby with optimal potential for subsequent intellectual and physical development. Mm -hmm. So clearly it's important that the line will be thick enough as part of that equation. So I won't transfer embryos. I will then cancel the cycle and I test the lining on all women who go through IVF with me. I do the endometrial assessment during the cycle. The good news of Viagra is that within 48 hours, you can take a poor lining and improve it. Wow. So we can give a woman Viagra when she's got a thin lining, 48 to 72 hours later, the lining can be lush and everything goes forward normally. Mm -hmm. So there's a way to rescue a poor lining if you use Viagra, as long as there's estrogen on board as well. That's really exciting. That's amazing. And so do you find that your patients are quite well read? Do they come into their checkups sort of uh, predicting what might happen and having Googled everything under the sun in terms of 
where their um how their follicles are developing and what what it means in terms of their uterine lining thickness well i'm one of those crazy guys who believes in giving as much information as possible mm -hmm. so every consultation i do with patients are online wherever they come from treatment i do is in new york on my own patients with the help of dr tortoriello but i do them there but the consultations are as we're doing now online yeah. So I'll spend an hour before the consultation reviewing a questionnaire that's been included, completed by the patients, get all their old records, put together a template, and then go into the consultation. And when I'm done with the consultation with the patient, from that point on, we start the process of preparing the patients. So I'm a glutton for giving a large amount of information. To the point that uh, we have two books that are available online to patients. One is a book on immunology, which I wrote because there's really nothing out there. It's an e-book which they can basically gain access to. I think you've given a link to it in, your, in the article. Yep, and yep. it's only 45 pages long. They can download it and read it, and they'll know a lot more than most people do about what's going on. The second is a book that Dr. Tortoriello and I just jointly wrote. It's a book that is long. It's an, op it's an operational manual on how and why we do what we do. And it individualizes the approach and goes down into the nitty gritty. It's about 160 pages long. It's not yet out there in, in the public arena, but I've made it available to all our patients through our website. Fantastic. Where they can actually go to the website and then read it online. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. And um, do you offer immunology treatment to most of your patients or is it just ones where you've done testing and you think this is, you know, this is something that's need? Would everyone have the immuno immunology tests? Not everybody by any means. Again, it's those people who are predisposed where there's no explanation for why they're failing and with the current failures. So those patients get, get it done de novo from the start. The rest of the patients don't get it outright. They get it when we see there's a problem developing, mm -hmm. which there often is, and we do then do the intense evaluation. But not everybody gets treated. Only those people selectively who have the need. And that's by no means everybody. Yeah. I found out from immunology testing that I have factor five Leiden, so and another blood clotting disorder. So that was hugely relevant information for the cycle. So for living in terms of flying and all sorts of things. Oh, sure. sure. But people often make the mistake of believing what you're describing, MTHFR, PAI, um, factor V Leiden, protein C, all these are factors when they're abnormal that point towards a condition called thrombophilia. Mm -hmm. It's not a true immunologic problem. It's a hereditary clotting defect. And there's a misinformation out there because Treating this does not improve the chance of getting pregnant. It also doesn't prevent miscarriage. Mm -hmm. But what it does is it prevents complications, late miscarriages in pregnancy, late ones, mid-trimester, and it can reduce the risk of pregnancy-induced complications like preeclampsia, premature separation of the placenta, prevent the risk of blood clots that occur in women after the birth of a child. Yes, it's, a very, it's very relevant to protect you from things you just described, traveling and developing blood clots on the birth control pill, this, that, and the other. Exactly. But it's separate as an issue from immunologic implantation dysfunction. Mm -hmm, absolutely. But I was, I was pleased to have that, well, not pleased to have that diagnosis, but it was useful to know going into pregnancy. Absolutely. With a singleton, and then I had twins, um, because I wouldn't have known that for, you know, the... Uh, pregnancy care and the blood thinning injections. No question. Stockings throughout. So it was useful to have found that out through fertility treatment. Absolutely. I agree. And so uh, any more that you want to add in terms of implantation dysfunction and our immune system um, and whether all doctors in this space believe that immunology plays a role? Because I know that No, by no means. Very few doctors, very controversial, but you have to ask yourself the question, why? And the reason why is very simple. Firstly, understand that nothing we do in IVF, where we assess the efficacy of what we do on the basis of outcome, 
can be proven through gold standard statistical analyses. And the reason is we spoke about the quality of the embryo and we spoke about the receptivity of the uterus. Mm -hmm. And there are myriads of causes, variables that play a role. And to do a gold standard randomized controlled study, you've got to be able to keep all the variables stable and change only one. Does it work? Is it better? Does it not? And you can't do that in IVF. Yeah. There are too many variables. So everything we do really is based upon experience, seasoning, based on sound scientific principles. And you might ask the question, if that is true, why is it then that so many people say, I don't use it because there's no statistical proof it works? Because there is no statistical way in which you can prove anything that you do when you compare it to, uh, we use outcome as the end point. And most doctors do not want to get involved in immunology. It's a field that is far larger than the entire field of IVF. And they really do not feel that there's a benefit to them or their practices to get involved. Many of them, when they get out of their depth, will refer them to those of us that have an interest. Right. But very often, they don't. And these people keep spinning their wheels over and over, thinking there's no hope for them when there really is. Mm -hmm. And if there's no detrimental harm to, you know, having this immunology treatment, then it's kind of makes sense to have it if you can see something flagged, doesn't it? I, I believe so. But I think like with anything in life, in medicine certainly, you, you treat when you have a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. You don't just treat empirically. Yeah. I use the analogy that's like going out duck hunting and only shooting where you hear the quacking above your head. You're not going to end up with a duck dinner. You've got to aim, take aim, and be able to be more assured you'll be successful. Mm -hmm. This is the same when it comes to anything you do in medicine. You only treat if there's a, a rational basis for that treatment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes complete sense. Any key takeaways that you think the fertility community would be helpful for everyone watching or watching back? Uh, we didn't talk about the one cause of immunologic implantation dysfunction that I call IID, abbreviated to that. And that is the alloimmune variety. I don't want to go into detail. It's very complex. And okay. there's a big section in that little book that I told you you can download. But here what happens is that when a baby, when an embryo reaches the uterus, it's only going to attach if it is immunogenetically distinct from the mother's uterus. And that happens uh, when the embryo carries a certain genetic similarity to the woman, which can be seen in certain genes like DQ alpha HLA, if there are similarities, then that embryo will match the woman's uh, genetic makeup too, too, too much. And as a consequence, the uterus is considered to be an invading organism and try to evict it. And the way it evicts it is by activating the natural killer cells in the wall of the uterus. But this happens over time. If a woman doesn't have both problems, that match that I've spoken about genetically, plus natural killer cell activation, she's not got any problems. But if she's got both, then the likelihood of getting pregnant and having a baby, regardless of age, is really very, very small in the very low single digits. And if she does get pregnant, she's likely to miscarry. Because this builds up over time with repeated exposures to embryos that are normal, it explains why we so often see women in this category having had a baby without a problem. And then when they try to get pregnant again, they either can't or they keep miscarrying. Most women, or most people know people like this that have had a baby and then can't repeat it. Very often this is due to that match. And the match is again linked to natural killer cell activation. So you might think to yourself, well, same treatment, intralipid and steroids doesn't work as easily because if the embryo matches, you can give all that treatment in the world. Mm -hmm. It'll still be rejected. You've got to be able to have an embryo that doesn't match. Fortunately, in these cases where there's this alloimmune match, it happens in one in two embryos. So one embryo will match and the other won't. That's why we don't like to put back two embryos in women like that. Even so, um, because if you do that, then the embryo that matches will muddy the waters for both 
and neither will take. So it's really important if you've got a history of recurrent pregnancy loss or a history of not having been successful with regular immunologic therapy, it's worthwhile considering the possibility that this could be alloimmune because there is treatment. There is treatment for that that can be effective. That's fascinating. And also, as you mentioned, you know, embryos are precious cargo, aren't they? So you don't want to jeopardize the chance of using one unnecessarily. Absolutely. Um, and what about on the flip side for someone who's having egg donation? Any considerations there in terms of the body's receptivity to an embryo? The anatomical factors all play a role. But, uh, and immunologic factors, if it's autoimmune, play a role because that's like walking into a minefield. Doesn't matter which embryo gets into the uterus where there's a lot of activated natural killer cells, they're going to be destroyed. But it's not a big problem with the alloimmune variety mm -hmm. because in, it's not a matter of the egg and the sperm. It's a matter of the woman and the man. The woman, the man producing the sperm and the uterus that carries the embryo. Yeah. So even with egg donation, the alloimmune variety plays a role and treating it with intralipid and steroids is not going to solve the problem with recurrent miscarriage, for example, if it occurs where there's an alloimmune problem. Fascinating. Thank you so much. I have learned so much today. And as we mentioned before, Dr. Cher has written a brilliant article, uh, which will be linked up in our bio. So please go and read more about embryo implantation dysfunction today. And do contact the team at Cher Fertility Solutions, who would be delighted to help you and arrange a consultation. Um, as Dr. Cher mentioned, based in Las Vegas, and they also have a clinical course in uh, New York as well and someone just asked is it going to be recorded so you can watch it back absolutely we'll follow follow both accounts we'll be sharing it very soon and on our website so thank you so much for please anyone reach out to us or to their team directly and we'd be happy to help can I mention one thing before please I go do. Please do. an easy way to reach me if there's a need or a desire to, to have an online consultation with me for a particular problem is to contact my assistant her name is Patty, and you can reach her by calling her directly at 702-533-2691. That's, again, 702-533-2691. Perfect. Thank you Thank so you so much. much for having me on. It was lovely to speak to you. Thanks for those who have joined. My great pleasure. Thank you so Have much. a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.